And happy Friday, everyone. Welcome to Navigate B2B. I'm your host, Steve Ferreira, CEO of Ocean Audit, a global ocean freight refund consultancy company up here in Hartford, Connecticut. So nice to be here today. So much breaking news this week. It's just been incredible. I have to say the velocity of new LinkedIn users and uh, followers that I've had in the last 48 to 72 hours, I have never seen my LinkedIn growth uh, grow so rapidly. And it's only because I, like many professionals in our trade, um, recognize the, the serious issues uh, happening over in Egypt and the Suez Canal with the Ever Given. And we have a heck of a show today. I, I definitely think this is probably one of my best shows. Of course, I say that every week. But uh, later on in the show, we have uh, Jess Dankert. Uh, Jess is the uh, VP of Supply Chain mm -hmm. at the Retail Industry Leaders Association. Uh, no bigger or better group to talk about um, the uh, ocean freight uh, challenges and systemic changes in ocean freight. And we'll get to Jess in about 10 or 12 minutes. Uh, but first, back to the news on um, the, uh, the Ever Given. You know, as I said, I've been trying to follow this story uh, because I look at this as a, a type of potential swan event. And um, I don't know, it's just call it once, you know, being snake bitten a few many times. But uh, I wanted to bring my audience up to date. A few things before I prepared some great charts today. But before I start to talk about some of the slides and charts I have to help you follow this story for your own businesses, I do want to talk about uh, uh, this uh, incident um, that's happening right now. Uh, reminds me, everyone knows I'm always famous for interjecting a, a movie analogy in what I do. But uh, one of my favorite films is 2012 with uh, John Cusack. Cusack? Cusack. John Cusack. Sorry, I always get that wrong. And um, there's a part where they've kind of saved the day and they've avoided the tsunami and the captain says, we're heading for the Cape of Good Hope, right? And, and that's you know kind of where the hope of the world is. And you don't hear that expression much, Cape of Good Hope, Southern Tip of Africa. But it seems like many, many ships right now in uh, that part of the, in the Suez area are making a beeline for the Cape of Good Hope because it does look like we are going to be in quite a traffic jam in the Suez. Now, let's set the facts. The best opportunity to potentially um, refloat the ever given is Saturday where high tides come, Saturday Egypt time, I believe it's Saturday evening. Now, high tides have come and gone before, and it hasn't had much of, a, much of an impact on the vessel. But we'll get to why there might be some a, a glimmer of hope. I'm not holding out a lot right now, but um, I'll talk about that as we progress the show. Now, the world reaction on this is crazy, right? The stock market pre-market right now on all shipping stocks as of uh, 9.33, I've been keeping my other eye on the monitor, stocks are popping. Uh, the uh, prices of stocks uh, in, in shipping and maritime and energy are going up. Uh, oil has gone up 2.5%. Um, I haven't checked the last uh, tick on the, uh, on the market, but um, right now it's, uh, it's being perceived by Wall Street that uh, prices will increase ocean and container and, and, uh, and tanker companies will uh, be making more profits because of this potential swan event. So that's one thing to keep an eye on is the markets. I think we really need to focus on that. Um, not to mention the fact that over 400 million uh, per hour is being lost by the blockage in the, uh, in the Suez. Now, something else that came up today through some intelligence um, in uh, the UK that I picked up on is I hate to go there, but uh, one of the things is that there are 250 vessels in the uh, canal and uh, they have uh, a variety of uh, product, obviously, flammable oils, tankers, chemicals, consumer goods. Um, suffice, to, suffice to say, uh, the region is always, you know, um, one that needs to be looked at very closely from a uh, command and control security perspective. And there are some experts that believe that uh, having 250 vessels queued up in the Suez presents kind of a sitting duck scenario. So you have kind of all types of uh, 
you know, I guess uh, Robert Ludlum at like um, uh, scenarios going on. Um, last but not least, the uh, the crew is uh, safe on the Ever Given, which is, you know, obviously we're all concerned about uh, maritime uh, uh, seafarer safety. And uh, that is a good news to report on. But um, let's take a look at how this all happened. And I have some great um, animation that uh, we've prepared here. You can see here the Ever Given um, coming up into the uh, picture right there in the yellow, um, uh, the yellow uh, triangle. This is uh, the real time uh, incident that happened. You can see the winds uh, took her um, and uh, uh, put her bow into the uh, into the uh, right hand side of the canal. I'm sorry, the, the left hand side of the canal, I believe it was. And um, she pivoted. And uh, this is something they call the sail effect because the containers being um, so highly stacked. Now we have some real film that just came out of Egypt in the last two hours. That is, uh, I think, somewhat exclusive to the U.S. market. We we did get uh, get it from Egypt. I'm going to run this film for you. Um, you see the uh, Ever Given um, still uh, in peril uh, sideways, and you will see in this uh, segment some of the uh, uh, lines of ships that are uh, that are queued up uh, behind it. And, uh, you know, it's quite a bit of traffic and you can see how heavily laden these are with containers. And I think it's just amazing. The uh, sail effect definitely impacted how the uh, how the ever given ended up into that perilous position. Um, now, unlike some rumors here, we don't believe there was a uh, power incident where the, the vessel lost power. We do believe that this was a uh, uh, the fact that the. Ever Given was going into a very treacherous area of the canal, and that this treacherous area uh, is very narrow and combined with the full stack deck. Now, of course, you know, we've read about why the full stacks cause a lot of maritime incidents and, and lost containers. And this time, having such a high profile on the deck caused the, uh, the, 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 the vessel to uh, uh, fishtail, so to speak, and pivot uh, into the channel. And she's really wedged in there now. And um, I do believe that uh, I would like to show you real time on marine traffic where we have the uh, vessel right now. This is uh, this is real time. And we can still see that uh, the uh, Dutch crews and, and the uh, uh, the uh, dredging crews have not made uh, good headway. I would like to show you the um, 250 vessels that have caused the uh, that are in the backlog. I think we have another shot in marine traffic of the uh, alternative. And um, this shot is uh, is pretty cool because you can actually see, um, you know, the in the channel there where um, the beginning of the vessel. And then if you grow if we go up north. Uh, we can see the i think we can see the little blinking icon where the ever given uh is but uh we have uh we have quite a um yeah just keep going up there a little bit more and yeah she's in there somewhere we have to zoom in but uh, that's kind of the real time of where the uh the uh, the vessel is situated now um one of the cool things is that the Dutch are super at uh, helping um, uh, special salvage operations. I want to show you how the Ever Given could be potentially uh, salvaged and moved and what the options are. So there are a couple of ways that we're doing this or that they're doing this uh, using, of course, tugs and uh, diggers on the side to try to dredge the, uh, the sides to make them a little bit bigger. So when high tide comes, the vessel can pivot. And then obviously we have dredging. Supposedly there are special dredging machines in place now to try to uh, create more in uh, picture, picture number two there. We try to get more soil and silt out of the way so the vessel can make that crucial turn. The last case scenario, which you know really would uh, create a, a more of a swan-like event is if we have to go in and bring some special equipment in to uh, lighten the load and, and remove some marine containers there. Um, so. Right now, the hope is, is that uh, the uh, Saturday event on high tide, um, I don't really want to go there and say that's the panacea, right? Because, you know, it's, you know, twice, once bitten, twice burned, I guess is how they say it. Um, you know, you have the rumor if somebody sees it move a little bit, you know, that it's free. 
the reality is, is that there's so many structural issues to contend with. There's also a sagging issue where they could possibly be placing undue stress on the uh, on the body of the vessel itself. And so there's a lot of people with a lot of fingers crossed because it's almost like, you know, have you ever been in a snow, um, where, you know, your car is stuck in the snow and, you know, how you orchestrate the power of the tires and, and the steering, you know, again, that's a very simplistic way to look at um, how we're going to get out of this uh, this big mess. But uh, they want to um, uh, actually dredge about 16 meters, and that's a huge amount of silt and uh, material that would have to be moved. So all of these are the kind of um, scenarios that um, the salvage uh, companies and the Suez Canal authorities, the ship owners are all looking at. Um, you know, it's funny, I, I don't want to speculate, but when I did look at the uh, video, that we, we saw earlier, I actually was not comfortable with how one of the stacks was sitting on the vessel. So uh, I don't want to speculate that there's anything that uh, could cause a, a further delay, but I think we're definitely in a, a preponderance of a, of a potential, uh, the first beginnings of a swan event if we can't get the uh, vessel um, salvaged by the weekend. So that's my uh, latest update. I just want to make sure I've covered all the areas. Um, as I said, the stock market is soaring with regards to shipping stocks. Oil is up. And um, some of us informally believe that uh, this could have a 1% increase in your ocean freight rates for the balance of 2021 if it's not resolved quickly. I think that's a huge issue. And I, I think it's really um, you know, a great uh, segue into um, being able to introduce my um, live guest today, uh, Jess Dankert. Jess is the Vice President of Supply Chain for RELA, the Retail Industry Leaders Association. And uh, Jess, I want to welcome you to, welcome you to Navigate B2B. Thanks, Steve. Great to be here. Appreciate the invitation. Oh, it's, uh, it's my honor to have you. It's just, as I, as I told the audience uh, before, we have so many uh, interesting breaking stories with, uh, obviously, uh, the world watching the Suez, but the world is watching uh, retail and, and, and the reopening. And I can't think of a better person and representative of that to have uh, than yourself. So I'm, I'm so pleased that you're here. Jess, why don't you tell the audience a little bit? Uh, of course, you know, there are um, all of us uh, industry guys out there that know about RELA and uh, what it is you do. But uh, could you give maybe a little background on RELA, a little background on yourself, and then we'll kind of jump into the some of the key pivotal moments. Sure, absolutely. Uh, and again, thanks for uh, thanks for having me on the show. Um, RELA is the Retail Industry Leaders Association, and we're the trade association for the largest and leading retailers in North America. So uh, we have a number of functions. Uh, those include uh, public policy and advocacy, um, operational support and uh, thought leadership and research events as well. Uh, but typically, we serve our members who are, again, the, the large retailers uh, who help serve the American consumer. That's terrific, Jess. And I know that uh, you have your uh, pulse on um, many different uh, subcommittees and uh, suborganizations to help kind of command and control and, and uh, have audiences with uh, the best and brightest and, and most senior executives in, in, um, in your retail membership. Could you perhaps tell the audience a little bit about so how some of your organiz how some of your committees are organized? I think it will help us to help the audience better to understand how important some of these issues are in, in, in port optimization. So could you talk a little bit about maybe like the 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 individual committees that you have within RELA? Sure, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that RELA does uh, as a trade association as a function for our members is convening uh, executive peer communities uh, for members to learn from each other, uh, knowledge sharing, benchmarking, and that sort of thing. Um, but more generally to try and gather the thought leadership and uh, see where there are common interests, common challenges. So it really gives us a, a sight line into um, where a lot of those common challenges are. And then in, in my space, particularly in, in the supply chain, uh, really gives us some nice visibility as to um, what uh, things are looking like in the retail supply chain, what are the challenges, um, and then what retailers are doing uh, to address some of those challenges and, and ways that they're uh, adjusting operations and kind of continually pivoting uh, to adjust to uh, the ever-changing uh, supply chain situation of, of today. 
So you have uh, you have the ear and eyes of, uh, uh, for example, at any of the major retailers, you'd be working with uh, the SVPs, the supply chain, uh, global logistics, domestic logistics. Is that pretty much the types of uh, uh, interface that you have with the membership, Jess? Yeah, at least of all of our, you know, our member company needs, uh, typically the folks who are involved in our um, executive peer communities are the uh, the higher level executives um, within the companies. Um, and we bring them together again for knowledge sharing and just provide a forum for, uh, for learning uh, from outside executives and from each other and so forth. And just, you know, we talked before and, you know, I, I think that uh, there's so much of a backstory and you've got such a depth of knowledge and we're dying to get into some of the mm -hmm. uh, um, advantages and, and uh, mind sharing, uh, masterminding that you guys have done to help <laughs> and, and share with your retail um, um, members. But I do think I do want to acknowledge uh, to the audience that um, uh Rila, along with, uh, I believe, some other organization, um, and just you can fill me in a little bit, you were really responsible for helping, for example, the Federal Maritime Commission look at informed consent decisions on detention and demerge. I believe that's a huge accomplishment. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, well, there was a coalition uh, for more efficient ports that was formed back in, I believe it was 2016. Rila was a part of that. Uh, coalition along with a, a number of other uh, associations, to your point. Um, and that group really uh, moved a petition um, forward to uh, address the uh, situation around detention and demerge and, and fees more generally uh, through the Maritime, Federal Maritime Commission. The Federal Maritime Commission has, has been great about uh, you know, listening to all the stakeholder input and factoring in you know, the situations and, and trying to come up with a you know, fair and equitable solution. Spring of last year, they, they finally finalized the uh, interpretive rule uh, around detention and demerge, and so we've seen the rollout of that, and, um, and hopefully the application of that within uh, detention and demerge situations. Uh, really looking at just um, being sure to uh, use those those sorts of fees and, and calculations around per diem detention demerge in the way that they're originally meant to be used, uh, which is to improve the fluidity of freight movement um, versus, you know, as a revenue generator or kind of punitive, but to really ensure that things continue to move so that, and particularly germane to uh, situations like we find ourselves in now in terms of the, the um, port congestion and just general supply chain congestion that we're seeing uh, you know, prevalent in the U.S. right now, uh, being able to uh, ensure that uh, in situations where it's truly out of the control of the shippers, that the application of, uh, of those fees is you know, appropriate and uh, is fair. Um, and Federal Maritime Commission has been, I think, really good about working with all the stakeholder parties uh, to, um, uh, to listen and take an input and provide an a interpretive, um, interpretive rule guidance that uh, has, I think, the potential to really help alleviate um, some of the problems we had seen previously. I think it's a great uh, initiative. And, you know, I've always been a big advocate of um, the things that Rila supports uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, FMC issues, uh, infrastructure, obviously ports. And I think that, you know, one of the big areas of, of your engagement or involvement with a lot of your members is really that systemic challenge of kind of uh, ocean shipping and port operations. As a matter of fact, I have a, a major uh, uh, client retailer or a client, I guess I'll call it a client, and they, uh, they came up with an amazing job role, for example, where they want to kind of have an ambassador to kind of navigate through the ports and the infrastructure issues that they're dealing with as a result of ocean shipping, right? So it's kind of gone three-dimensional for this client. I think it's a brilliant strategy. Can you talk a little bit about how, um, in your conversations with Rila members, how some of them are overcoming the challenges right now? of the infrastructure issues and the fact that uh, we don't want to repeat the mistakes of yesteryear. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't think it's, it's not a surprise to anyone who's, uh, who's watching us now and who's at all familiar with the situation. And even those who were not previously familiar, it's been in the news quite a lot, the, uh, the issues in the supply chain more generally and certainly around the port, uh, looking at congestion and just the delays uh, that are being caused. So. Retailers um, and indeed shippers from many industries are uh, experiencing costly delays uh, and disruptions in the supply chain. And looking at that supply chain, you know, these lean, just-in-time supply chains um, that have been built uh, to be, you know, 
um, very responsive are particularly affected by delays, you know, at origin related to container availability, you know, tight capacity, rolling issues, and that sort of thing. Um, and then, you know, once they reach our shores, you know, they could see even more delays and in, in spend time at anchor, or, you know, awaiting uh, being unloaded from the from the ship, followed by even more time on land um, while the retailer is working to move that cargo along. And throughout this journey, Costs continue to accrue, uh, you know, on that freight, and uh, either whether that's you know fees uh, that are that are mounting up, or just lost sales you know, and, and disappointing consumers, uh, disappointing customer expectations, uh, and that sort of thing. So these delays are costing you know, millions of dollars in fees and, and charges. Uh, but really, what's harder to quantify is that the, you know the lost sales uh, potentially resulting from missing those windows. The customer expectations um, and you know merchandise is sometimes you know, taking several extra weeks to get to where it needs to be and uh, you know in as you know and to the point of you know when you were talking about the ever given anytime something in the supply chain isn't moving that's not a great thing you always want to keep <laughs> those things moving so if something's standing still something's wrong so anytime you know you're at anchor or, or backed up uh, and whatnot if something something that mo- if things aren't moving something's wrong so. Anytime you see that, it's you know never a good thing for the supply chain. So we, what we see the retailers doing, obviously, you know, people in supply chain, as you know, people in supply chain are problem solvers. So they're uh, you know always trying to figure out, uh, you know, how do we, um, you know, here's the challenge, how do we work around that? How do we figure out a plan B or plan C uh, and make this still work? So that in the case of retail, we're still getting that, you know, trying to get that merchandise to the consumers. It's challenging, uh, you know, when things are, are, are stranded either at anchor or are awaiting, uh, you know, taking extra days, uh, waiting for rail cars, waiting for, you know, to be able to move. Uh, so there's been a, a lot of needing to pivot on the retailer side um, just to address the effects of these congestions. And I think you've seen a lot of that in, in news reports and, and heard a lot from, you know, retailers who are being affected by this. Um, so you'll see that kind of impact to inventory and, and what that may look like. Um, and all of this on, you know, what we uh, believe to be, you know, 2021 will be a very strong year for uh, for retailers. So customers are wanting to buy things. Uh, it's just a question of the retailers, you know, uh, uh, needing to pivot and and find workarounds so that they can get the merchandise to the customers uh, who do want to buy it. Well said. Well said. And and uh, for my audience, you're watching. Uh, Steve Ferrara, Navigate B2B with my special guest, uh, Jess Dankert, uh, VP of Supply Chain at uh, at Retail, the Retail Industry Leaders Association. Jess, you know, I was thinking about this a little bit as, you know, we start to reopen. And I almost wonder if it's uh, with re- every, every every retailer has their own strategy and what works for them, what, what, what they need to address in both in e-commerce and physical. Um, is it kind of chicken and egg in terms of your opinion? You start to look at the reopening. Um, is there more an expectation that, uh, okay, we need to really replenish the stores or we need to, you know, have a mix better of e-commerce and stores uh, without del- delving into any kind of confidentiality? What are you finding kind of on the, the mix of how to get the, the supply chain to the consumer at the right time? Yeah, and I think, you know, to the point of reopening, I think retail and open throughout and as particularly in the essential um, uh, you know, the stores that have been open throughout and continuing to serve the customer uh, continuing to get, you know, the essential goods that, that folks need uh, and want to get through, you know, the early days of the pandemic when we think back to that uh, that time frame. Um, but continuing to serve customers, even, you know, when physical stores were closed, uh, continuing to serve customers in ways through, you know, the quick deployment of uh, and standing up of uh, curbside and, and uh, being able to pick up at the store, curbside pickup uh, at stores that were closed, you know, in, in, internally. Uh, but also looking at e-commerce and the dramatic acceleration of uh, of e-commerce that we saw, particularly in the in the early days of the pandemic, retailers have been open throughout, so they've been continuing to serve the customers. Um, and really, where we're seeing now the shift now is more of that store traffic returning, where uh, where it might have been a little lighter um, previously. But even looking back at you know the holiday season, it was it was pretty strong, all things considered, and. Looking ahead to, as I said, the, you know, the balance of 2021, I think we'll just see those numbers in terms of store traffic continue to grow. But e-commerce has been uh, really strong throughout. And I think uh, you know, the impacts that you look at there, um, kind of behind the scenes, retailers are, are really looking at 
having gone through this acceleration of, of e-commerce adoption that compressed the growth of, and you'll see various estimates, but basically, you know, a, a growth of, you know, three to five years of e-commerce uh, adoption compressed into the space of a couple of months. It's amazing. Very dramatic and, and you know, something that you never could have expected. So really you're seeing now a lot of addressing how do we uh, how do we make sure that the networks and kind of the, we've gone through this kind of fire drill and trying to quickly pivot and address these things? How do we go back and make sure we're doing things you know the most effective and efficient way? How do we make sure our network is positioned for what we believe to be will be a you know pretty sticky level of e-commerce and we'll just continue to grow? I don't think we're you know reverting back to where we were pre-pandemic. So a lot of kind of adjustments on that front as well. Right. No, I was, you know, you make a great point. And uh, I, I should have used the word uh, stimulus package when I used the word uh, reopening, uh, obviously. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I'm thinking uh, I'm thinking probably like you and your members are that we're going to still see, a, a, you know, a panacea of 100,000 more containers a month. I'm, I, I, I tell you what, Jess, you mark my words. I think your retailers are going to have a, a great year because I think the uh, the in-person store visits will increase, and obviously the e-commerce is not going away. But that's really, you know, where I was kind of going with that question is I think the stimulus is really going to help your uh, your members. You know, um, one of the things I wanted to ask you is uh, what might be some things that you know we don't see in the mainstream press with regards to you know maybe um, challenge additional challenges for 2021 for the retailers and maybe even additional opportunities. Uh, could you comment on that either way? Sure. Yeah, and I think you know to your to your earlier point around the upcoming you know, the the stimulus and and where we'll see a lot of the economy drivers. Um, you know, I think that's absolutely right. And I know on, on your show last week you talked about you know, the effect that, that all this increased spending will have on um, you know the container flow and, and the freight movement. To your point, I don't think we're you know near the end of uh, the tunnel on where we see the congestion. And the issues that that the supply chains have been going through. So I think that um, you know you're absolutely right. This is not over by a long shot. So what we're missing about that in kind of the broader conversation potentially is um, how do we how do we fix things for the long term? There's a lot of focus on kind of the acute issues now, which we really do need to figure out and get things moving. And I know that um, all the stakeholders are you know working at at how we clear this up and and, and get things moving more efficiently and uh, and more fluid. But I think looking at kind of the, the longer term aspect, the real opportunity here uh, is we need to be thinking about what these next generation ports will look like and where we need to um, make those investments so that we, uh, you know, our ports and our supply chains remain competitive on the global stage. So there are a lot of conversations uh, in Washington, D.C., where I am uh, around infrastructure right now, certainly, you know, as usual, but a lot of conversations around infrastructure. And so I think in in those conversations, what needs to be uh, you know taken into account is the um, uh, the input of the folks who are the largest users of a lot of that infrastructure to make sure that you know the limited dollars uh, that there there uh, will be are invested in the places where they really have the maximum impact to um, to the broadest number of people. And in looking at you know the ports, it is you know traditional infrastructure type of projects. But also looking at you know the last mile connectors and the other pieces to that, as well as the you know the data and and technology infrastructure that overlays that and the opportunity right. to have more more visibility on on freight and uh, and where we get to that point where we know what's on the ships and when it's coming so we can plan. Right. You know, it's funny. You know, almost just like the ever given issue, which has its own macro and micro issues, uh, retail is facing just all these interesting and incredible challenges. And I'm sure with great leadership at the membership level and at RELA, uh, we're going to find ways to overcome this and make this just the best damn economy there is. Hey, Jess, how do, um, I know RELA is by membership only, but how do people follow a RELA or RELA.org, is it? or? Yes, our website is RELA.org, uh, our social, I think RELA tweets, uh, and you can find us on, on social media, but RELA.org okay. is our website. So uh, welcome to, to join and learn more. Thank you so much, Jess Danker, for joining us today. And uh, good day to Thank everybody you, from Navigate mm -hmm. B2B. Jess, I hope you'll come back again and, as we go through this together. Thank you, everyone, and have a great weekend.